In this third part of our Beyond Einstein series of conversations, we're venturing fairly far beyond the bounds of established science and into the exciting but tentative realm of scientific possibility. Joining me in this intriguing exploration will be renowned physicist Carlo Rovelli, and together we are going to delve into a topic that's as enigmatic as it is captivating the notion of white holes. Here is the basic idea. The laws of physics seem to allow any process that can occur in the usual temporal order to also occur in the reverse temporal order. Imagine, for example, a glass shattering on the floor, shards flying this way and that. Now picture the shards leaping from the floor and reassembling the glass back into your hand. This reverse process, unfamiliar though it is, is fully in keeping with our understanding of physics. Now, this concept of time reversal brings us to our main topic because the time reversal of a black hole is a white hole. While black holes are regions of space where nothing, not even light, can escape, white holes are theoretically the exact opposite. Nothing can enter as they spew out matter and light. As yet, there is no observational evidence for white holes, but Carlo Rovelli suggests that white holes might not only be real, but could also be the key to understanding one of the most persistent mysteries in astrophysics, the nature of dark matter. So let's now explore the possibilities that lie at the intersection of black holes, white holes, and dark matter with physicist and author Carlo Rovelli. And let us begin with Carlo Rovelli, the director of the Quantum Gravity Group of the Center for Theoretical Physics at Aix-Marseille University in France. He is a co-founder of the Loop Approach to Quantum Gravity and author of the forthcoming book entitled White Holes. <laughs> so Carlo, Thanks for joining us. Wonderful to speak to you again. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure. Um, so you heard we were talking a lot about some dark energy, yes. black holes, and you have been spending some time thinking about a more exotic version of a black hole, so to speak, which is a white hole. Before we get to it, can we motivate it by thinking more fundamentally about the laws of physics and this quality that they have, which we often in the field refer to as a sort of time reversal invariance, that the laws don't really know so much about a directionality in time. And that's at least one way to motivate the possibility of white holes. So is that a fundamental feature of physical law, this kind of insensitivity to forward in time versus backward in time? Yeah, as far as we know, yes. So all the, all the laws of physics, um, the fundamental laws are such as if they allow something to happen and you take a movie of this and you project the movie backward, this is also allowed. Now that's a little bit strange based upon everyday experience because... Because there's friction, there's dissipation, there's yeah. all the irreversible phenomena. But these come about when there are a lot of stuff that, get, uh, that makes it up. And when we're talking about black holes, in some sense, they're very simple, right? In some sense, they're very simple, yes. And so you can reverse them. Yes, and when you reverse them... You what, get a white hole. You get a white hole. So, so <laughs> I will leave it to you to give us a clearer sense of what white holes are and why we should think about them. Um, well, let me start from this. Uh, black holes are a fantastic story, right? Yeah. Because uh, uh, when I was a student, in, the, in my textbook was written that they probably don't exist. My teacher said... If they were written about at all, most textbooks didn't even mention would, them. Would not even yeah. mention them. Um, my, my teacher of general relativity was saying, yeah, but there's nothing like that in the universe. And a few people were studying them. It is a prediction uh, of, of Einstein theory, namely, Einstein theory uh, says that impossible they could exist. Yeah. But they also might not exist, right? So, and then slowly we started uh, recognizing things in the sky, which are black holes. In fact, uh, we have been uh, detecting a black hole b long before recognizing it. Because since the 30s, the people, first people who put a, a, a radio antenna pointing up, uh, Jansky in the 30s, yeah. 
uh, got this signal from the Sagittarius uh, constellation, a very strong signal, um, which nobody knew what it was. And that's the center of our Milky Way. At the galaxy. center of our Milky Way, it was this. Uh, it was a, it was a big impression at the time. It came out on the New York Times. Is that right? I didn't uh, know that. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah, yeah. It was came out of the universe, New York Times. A, a super strong signal coming from the stars, from the center of the galaxy. There was a uh, NBC radio uh, broadcast in which the sound of this really was, uh, and uh, and uh, Jansky was there, and they asked what it is, and they said, "Don't know. We don't know." And the uh, the pe person on the radio said it should be an incredibly powerful. Uh, mm, uh, source, because our you know radio tra stations are not going to be heard in the center of the galaxy. Yeah. In fact, it was thankfully. No. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nobody. Nobody knew what it was, and now we know. It's a, It's a, wow. this thing that we have just heard about the big black hole, the center of the galaxy. So black holes were uh, not recognized for a while. Then in the 70s there were first hints, and now we have this spectacular confirmation. White holes today are like black holes hmm. 20 years ago. Possi poss open possibility in the uh, predict are predicted by general relativity. It is a solution of, of, of the equation of general relativity. As, actually, as you said, it's not a different solution of black hole. It's the same solution backward. Backwards in time. Backwards in time, yeah. yes. And they might be out there, and I think there are reasons to believe that they, they're there. And, and why were they, or have they been, really, till today? I, I think that most physicists that haven't done a survey are of the point of view that is expressed in many of the famous textbooks of general relativity, that white holes, sure, there's a mathematical the formula, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, they don't, but they're not with, did I say, well, yeah, yeah, I mean yeah, yeah. white holes, because, yes. Because uh, uh, a black hole, we have a plausible story of how it's formed. Right. Actually, we don't know how it dies, but we have a plausible story of how it's, it's born, it starts which is, you know, a, a, a matter that collapses. A big star, if the star is very big, it's sort of kept open by the fact it's burning and the, the nuclear heat, fuel uh, and nuclear propping heat it that up. Makes, makes pressure, so it keeps it up. But as soon as the hydrogen is consumed, it cools down and then the weight, if the thing is so big, it squashes a rock, everything, and, yeah. and falls into itself and produces a black hole. And that's, at least the big black holes we see around, we think that at least many should be Born with it, like and Oppenheimer that. was part of the. Oppenheimer was uh, was the first, uh, uh, first model that uh, that uh, that. Uh, just before other work, yes. Just before other works, yes. That's right. Oppenheimer Schneider. That's yeah. a paper. Um, white holes. We don't know how they could. Oh, wait, wait. We didn't know until a few years ago <laughs> how they could be born, because uh, you know a black hole. Everybody knows a black hole. Everything falls inside. Yeah. Okay, nothing can come out. A white hole, it's immediate. If you just think of reversing the movie in your head, everything comes out and nothing can go inside. So if everything can comes out, who put the stuff in? Right. <laughs> where, where does it come from? So in fact, there were some speculations by some Russians, there's always a Russian, through it, a Russian theoretical physics, who suggested that uh, from the Big Bang, uh, there were some little Big Bangs at the Big Bang uh, which produced a white hole. But that was not really convincing. So people, people thought, well, they're not white holes because we don't know how they could be born. Right. And, yeah, please. And here is the novelty. And that's what I've been doing in the last five or oh, ten years, almost now. Which is the following. Um, all this is classical generativity, okay? But we know, we just heard a moment ago, uh, that classical generativity is wrong in the same sense in which Newton's theory is wrong or... Aristotle's in the sense that it needs wrong. to be superseded, not yes. that it makes wrong predictions, no, but right. has limited yeah, okay. range of validity. It's like yeah. Newton's theory is super right, but yeah. within a certain domain, range, and then yeah. when you go out. And we know that since the beginning, right? Einstein wrote his uh, uh, generativity main paper in 1915, and in 1916, one year later, there is a paper by Einstein that says, of course, my theory is wrong because of quantum mechanics. There is something missing. It cannot be the end of the story about gravity. So there's a problem of quantum gravity. Now, for black hole, there are two questions. First question, we see all this thing falling in, okay? We practically see the matter spiraling and going yep. in. Where does it go? 
What happened next? We know that it can cross the horizon. We, I, I trust general relativity completely at this point. Some people say, well, it may happen something. I don't believe it. So things go in, falls inside. I trust general relativity entirely. It goes toward the small. It gets squashed by very strong forces. At that point, it has quantum mechanics has to come in. Because it's so small at that point. That because it's so small, there's so yeah. much curvature, yeah. so much pressure, so much energy density, everything tell us that that's where quantum mechanics comes in. Yeah. Even more, if we don't think that quantum mechanics comes in and we think the general relativity is right, we get to the singularities, we get to nonsense, the, the, I say, the time stop. And it's important just to emphasize because people use the word singularity, they bandy it about as if it is a thing. Yeah. It's really just a message saying that we don't know what's going on, that the mathematics breaks down. So when we talk about the center of a black hole as a singularity, yeah. it is a place where we throw up our hands in the classical Einsteinian yeah. theory of general relativity. Yeah, so it's, as you say, it's a message that the theory goes wrong. Uh, but this is a weak message. We, we, we already knew that the theory goes wrong there. Yes. Because we expect quantum phenomena there. So we expect the Einstein equation not to be valid there. That's one open question. And the other open question, which is, turns out to be connected, is that we know, thanks to Stephen Hawking, which uh, has, I guess, convinced all of us, because it's very convincing, his theory, his calculations has been redone all sorts of ways, that if you take a black hole, you wait there for very long, it slowly evaporates, right? It radiates this. So it becomes smaller, 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 and then what? People say it disappears, but that... What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. The inside is still very large, yeah. okay? There's a huge inside. So it pops up into nothing. To and the inside people can think about is the, the long indentation, if you will, in the exactly, fabric of space time exactly. that's so still the, there. A black hole yeah. is really a long, long tube, not, not infinite, but very long. Yeah. But with time, it becomes longer and longer and longer and narrower and narrower. Right. Okay. And careful, the singularity is not down there. The singularity is when, it, when the tube shrinks to zero. Yeah. So the, the outside, the, the, the surface of the black hole, the thing we see from the outside, this little sphere, becomes smaller, 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 smaller. At some point, it, it's deep into the quantum regime. Yeah. What happened next? Question mark. Okay. So, here is what I told you. you you're a good scientist. Uh, we have two problems. We don't know how white holes are born, and we don't know what happened to black hole at the end of this story. Right. Here's the idea. The death of the black hole is the birth of the white hole. And that's the idea of the transition. So the, this tube becomes very, very long, very narrow. It, we enter in a quantum regime. Yeah. Classical theory doesn't work anymore. Now we have in a quantum regime, quantum jumps. Oh, yes, that's a, we are falling inside. This is the black hole that becomes longer and longer and longer. The quantum regime is the right, uh, the red line there. And what happened next? There is a, a, a jump to the opposite process. Namely, it, can, it bounces back. Now we're in a white hole. Um, the same process, here it, is, here it is. We keep going up, and the, 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 the white hole is the next phase where these long tubes come out. And now the horizon is not a black hole horizon, it's a white hole horizon. And so what would that, comes what would it, I mean, if there were a white hole horizon, if it was actually out there, if this isn't just theoretical ideas, what would it? look like? What would, would there be a specific signature that we could use to detect it? Okay, so after the red transition, we are back in classical relativity. Yeah. So we know everything, right? It's, uh, we're, we're home because sure. we're, we're... So we know everything about how, how the thing would, like, would look from, from the outside. I'm going to tell you in a moment. But careful, because this jump is a quantum jump. So in order to happen, you have to be in a quantum regime. So I would expect, that's the model we're working out, that it happens only when the black hole is very small. Right. So now we have a very, it's not small inside, it's kind of huge stuff, but this small throat. But then you're getting a small white hole, presumably. It becomes a small white hole. Right. So from the outside, a small white hole, it's a little thing, very teeny, that lives for very long because all the things have to come out, very slowly right. has to come out. So it's a very long life. It's called a remnant because the, the, the black hole dies and it leaves this remnant, 
which very, very slowly emits this, uh, and uh, this very, very slow radiation. And it's what? It's just a, a teeny, teeny thing with a mass. The mass is easy to compute because this is quantum gravity, it's a Planck mass. Which is about? My hair. There it is. You have more than I. I would not waste one of my <laughs> remaining ones. <laughs> I would do not do everything for science. Okay. No. <laughs> okay. So imagine one of these things flies by very fast. Yeah. Okay. But the hair we can see it. Well, I can see it. You can see it. But it is here. Um, because it interacts, because there's electron proton, so it's electric interacts electromagnetically. Uh, a, a white hole would have this mass, but would not interact electromagnetically. So it's only the, the gravity. And let me just, just quickly point out, because having a sense of scale, I think, helps people have an intuition. When we talk about the Planck length, where quantum mechanics and general relativity come together, it's a very small length, about 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. The Planck mass that you're referring to is tiny by everyday scales. Of course, uh, a piece of hair is so light, but that's enormous on the scales of elementary particles, the kinds of things for which the quantum world is usually applied to. So that's huge by the mass of an electron. Exactly. And that's why it has this dual role in what you're describing. Exactly. So when I talk about this white hole that we're studying, uh, when I talk to the particle physicists, they say, oh, but they're huge. Uh, Planck mass is enormous. Yeah. And when I talk to the astrophysicists, I say, but they're teeny, they're yeah. so teeny. Yeah. <laughs> okay, it's the same. Right. But careful, look, there's another way of saying that Planck mass, Planck energy, Planck uh, length, Planck area, Planck, all that stuff. Uh, um, immediately, this is quantum gravity, extreme energy, extremely small. But a Planck mass, no. Planck mass is that. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's a, so if there is a quantum gravity phenomena, phenomenon that we have a chance to observe, it has to do with the Planck mass. For sure. And here it is. Uh, it's a, a, a teeny um, white hole. Uh, big white holes might be unstable. There is some difficulty with them. But small black holes are most likely stabilized by, by gravity, by quantum gravity. And if you think uh, quantum gravity is a theory with a scale, the Planck mass, sure. and theories with a scale typically have a particle of that scale. So there should be Planck scale, Planck mass particles around. And if we detect them, we have an observation of quantum gravity. Now, the transition in your, in your approach from the black hole side to the white hole side, as you emphasize, has to pass through this quantum domain famously we're not quite sure what that quantum theory of gravity is. You've worked a number of years, a good fraction of your professional life on loop quantum gravity. I've worked on string theory, distinct approach. Have you been able to use loop quantum gravity to make this story more complete? Or does this still stand beyond the reach of the ideas that are still in progress to build quantum no, gravity. No, this story come out because, uh, in fact, I, I told you the story of uh, white holes, but the way I came into it is through loop quantum gravity. Yeah. And in fact, it's the opposite. I mean, the quantum, loop quantum gravity, uh, I would have put it, your string theory, so I should <laughs> choose my words carefully here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let me say, string theory is a wonderful theory. It's a unification of everything. It's fantastic. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let, no, let me put it nicely. Uh, here at the, at, the, at the World Science Festival, you had the big guys of the string theory saying, yeah, I'll do all that. Actually, it would all be great if we could understand, if we could have a theory of quantum space and quantum time. Okay. Now, loop quantum gravity doesn't do unification, doesn't do all the goodies of string theory. But it you said is... that pretty quietly just now. But, but I, just, I just, you know, he slipped in what it does into. But anyway, I'll, I'll just be quiet. You can keep going. It doesn't do unification. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's not so ambitious. But it is a theory of quantum space and a theory of quantum time. It definitely is. And I think it's a very good theory of quantum space. I don't know if it is a right theory. I don't know if the good Lord likes it. But it's a good theory, I think, of quantum space and quantum time. If those old guys would study the books of loop quantum gravity, I think they would like it. Um, so it allows us to exactly disappear the image, uh, study what happened in this transition. And in fact, you can do a calculation 
with loop quantum gravity, which uh, gives you the transition amplitude. You see, um, I mean, the, the likelihood of the transition taking place. Yes, I mean, yeah. the, the probability of jumping. You see, yeah. all, all around is classical space time. Sure. So this is a typical quantum jump. Like, you know, you use classical theory to one point, classical theory after, and in between, you want to know, can this happen? And what is the probability happen? Sure. Does it happen likely? Does it not happen likely? So you can do the calculation. And we're doing these calculations, approximating, throwing away piece, using computer. I mean, all, it's not easy calculations. And the calculations we do step by step, order by order. But we can do these calculations. And in fact, um, the calculation has been telling us, the first thing, I was hoping that the calculation would tell us that this can happen when the black hole is large. But the calculation is saying, no, no, that's extremely suppressed. That's extremely improbable. But when the black hole is small, the probability of this happening goes to one when it goes to... And, but can you trust your calculations in a regime where, say, an order by order approximate yes. approach may run into trouble because the... Oh, oh, can, can you trust the calculation? Um, I don't know. I, I, I am truncating the theory. I'm computing to first order in this truncation. Sure. It's not really an expansion, it's a truncation. And uh, the bet is that uh, if we could do higher order, it wouldn't change much. Okay, it's so a bit that's of a one. Bet. Of, it's quite a bet. That's one of the things we're we're we're, we're doing, right? right? Exactly. But look, this is exactly what we're doing. We, we are testing the theory. Sure. The theory is predicting this jump, and uh, so if there are primordial black holes yeah. small enough, uh, I'm not a cosmologist, so but there are people who are working out this, um, or if there is a big bounce and there were big black holes in the previous phase that go through the big bounce. Um, so if something in the early universe um, has produced this remnant, they should be around and we should be able to test it. And so this would be Planck scale remnants. Yes. And do you propose a specific way of looking for them? Well, yes. But let me first add another idea, which is um, speculative, but is what really motivating me. Um, uh, suppose there are many of these. So you have small particles, grains, powder, that only interacts gravitationally. There's a lot of them. Sounds like dark matter is it coming out. It very much sounds like dark matter. <laughs> <laughs> so these are natural candidates for dark matter. Of course, we don't know what dark matter is. There are three or four or five candidates. The best yeah. one we had is dyed. Uh, Supersymmetry. Super yeah. Well, it's not it's quite just... dead yet, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, but we don't know, right? So we yeah. really don't know. And that's beauty of science. We're, yeah. we're, let's see. And uh, so I have this hope that, uh, like the black hole that was observed from the 30s to the 70s uh, uh, for half a century without knowing what it is. Perhaps uh, we have been mm. observing these things in the form of dark matter for decades without knowing what they are. And uh, we are in the process, uh, I, I don't know, right? I mean, this, I, I've this, I written this book on white holes. And in the book, I say at page two, I don't know if white holes exist in the universe. So this is a tentative. It's a, I think it's, it's very important to say what we understand about the universe. Yeah. So these beautiful things we heard about black holes, that's solid, that we know it is. Um, Einstein equations were believable on the horizon, beyond the horizon, beyond the horizon. White holes is an idea of speculation. Yeah. But it would be an explanation of dark matter, which doesn't need uh, extra particles, change of equations. Uh, it just needs quantum mechanics and generativity. It doesn't even need strings. And, and so it's... <laughs> I'll, I'll just ignore that last part, but um, <laughs> um, well, actually, maybe I won't. So, um, so, so, there's still an issue of the singularity in the black hole solution. So, where do you address that? Because that will be lurking behind any of these proposals 
if it isn't somehow resolved by whatever theory of quantum gravity, string theory, loop quantum gravity that you're dealing with. No, the reason, can, can we have back yeah, the, can bring the, back the, 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 um, the, the, the uh, image? Uh, in fact, so I think there is something, actually, can we have the previous one? The one with, uh, yes, that. Um, this is, in my opinion, this is the best way of viewing the interior of a black hole, yeah. okay? Uh, there are different ways of viewing it because you can choose your time surface the way you want, the foliation. So that's, that's the best picture, mental picture one can have. And look, um, this is the, 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 the horizon is there, right? Yep. And then there's this long thing. And down at the tip is where the star that uh, formed this is, is falling. Now, intuitively, we think that the singularity is down at the tip, but that's not true. The singularity is not there. The singularity is when this tube shrinks. So it's not yeah, it's down a singularity there in, time, in the future. It's not a singularity in, space. in time, yes. not space. Right. Yeah. So it's it's in time there. So if the singularity is replaced by a quantum jump, um, it's not there. It's just like the singularity um, in the atom of the electron falling into the proton. It doesn't. There is a quantum. You see what. Loop quantum gravity tells us is that um, space is discrete. There is a minimal size. There's so nothing saying, smaller sure. than something. That's the main result of loop. That's a, the result of a calculation. Loop quantum gravity, like the, the energy of a harmonic oscillator, you cannot go down arbitrarily small. There is a minimum one. Right. And here the same. The size is a minimum one. So what happens when you go there? Uh, something must stop the. Right. Before now, of course, there's a similar statement in string theory, not that we're trying to trade know, achievements. I know. But, uh, <clears throat> no, no, but I know. It's a similar in string theory, and that's what makes me think that these ideas are correct. Mm. Because to some extent... Because if it agrees with string theory, it's probably right. <laughs> I like that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> if there's something that is both true in string theory and quantum gravity, it has a better chance to be right yeah. than it's just true in one. But we only have a couple of minutes, and I want to jump off f from that. So, So... Both you and I, let's put the, the possibility of white holes, it, it, it's really an interesting, and, and if they're found, spectacular. I mean, it really would be wonderful. But you and I have both been working on highly abstract fields for yeah. a long time that for most of their development are pretty divorced from yes. experiment. And some certainly would say, and they say it loudly, that the kind of science that we do is more metaphysics than physics because it's not something that's directly tied to experiment. Now, I have my own particular way of addressing that. What, what's your view on that? What do you say to people who describe things in those terms? To some extent, I agree with them. Namely, uh, I think that what I have been doing, um, it's going to be wasted unless at some point there is a clear uh, connection with experiments. Um, there is nothing wrong in doing theoretical. I mean, Copernicus did a purely theoretical thing. It took a century and a half before it turned out that his ideas uh, matched, ended up changed a little bit, sure. uh, matching reality better than previous ideas. So there is nothing wrong in this uh, speculative search. And uh, uh, there is some science that is. Uh, nourished by direct experiments. Quantum mechanics is an example. But there is certainly science which is not nourished by direct experiments. Copernicus, Einstein, other. Uh, however, it becomes credible only when it gets tested in some, some sense. Right. Testing doesn't mean yes and no. It means piling up success. Yeah. So you definitely come at your work from the traditional standpoint yeah. of I need this ultimately to describe the world. Yes, because otherwise, because that's a strength of science. Otherwise, we go free into speculation and we can go forever. And, or you're just and, doing mathematics, which is why I'm in both the math department and the physics department. That's called hedging your bets right there. <laughs> Look, I am also in the philosophy department. There you go. <laughs> just to be sure. <laughs> An even bigger hedge. So please join me in thanking Carlo Ravelli. Thank you. Very much. White holes as dark matter. Now, that would be a poetic resolution to one of the great mysteries of physics. But as we have emphasized, there is as yet no observational evidence for white holes. But 
But having said that, one can't help but note that there was a time when it would have been accurate to say there's no evidence for black holes. There's no evidence for gravitational waves. There's no evidence for dark energy. There's no evidence for the Big Bang. And yet, as science has marched on, we have uncovered evidence for all of these once exotic features of general relativity. Will the same pattern play out for white holes? Only time will tell. All right. If you have not yet watched the other conversations in our Beyond Einstein series, I encourage you to do so, as it is enormously gratifying to see how far Einstein took us and how far beyond Einstein we have now journeyed. Okay, until next time from the World Science Festival, I am Brian Greene.